From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined in spirit with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Decant. Uh, most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Going to be uh, completely transparent because transparency is important to us on this show and hopefully important to those of us listening along. We are not in the studio today. Mm-mm. No, we're in a hotel in Orlando. Is it a motel no. or a hotel? Or a holiday inn. It's a little resorty, actually. There's a lazy river outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, a pretty dope water slide situation that we have not had a chance to enjoy yet. But maybe after this. I heard good things about the water slide. It's true. A, cer- a series of circumstances have found us here in Orlando. But uh, we also found ourselves compelled to update a very important topic that you have doubtlessly read about in the news recently, and you have known about since at least January, if you are a longtime listener of our show. Uh, Perhaps we can sum it up thusly. I don't know. You want to do some foreshadowing from the New York Times? Yes. So uh, yesterday, as we're recording this, New York Times opinion columnist Ross Duthot, I think that's how you say it, Uh, He wrote a piece called Jeffrey Epstein and When to Take Conspiracies Seriously. Interesting. Yeah, and we highly recommend that you read this, just first of all, but here is just a little bit of a taste. Yeah, a couple of uh, pretty quotable quotes here. Uh, This is just so so, uh, validating for us as a show. I love this. Uh, The challenge in thinking about a case like the suspicious suicide of Jeffrey Epstein, the supposed billionaire who spent his life acquiring sex slaves and serving as a procurer to the ruling class, can be summed up in two sentences. Most conspiracy theories are false, but often some of the things they're trying to explain are real. Yeah, it's pretty intense. And that's all you really need to know. That's just how he gets into the article. But he goes on to explain, essentially, what we do on this show. Exactly. I mean, you, you, this, this, those last two sentences could kind of be a thesis statement or a mission statement for this show. Um, so many of the things we talk about are a mix of provable things and completely what things that you would wildly conjecture on whether they're real or false or trumped up to explain things by kind of using reverse logic to impose a narrative on things that we maybe don't fully understand, whether it's the inner workings of the government or UFOs or anything like that. The, you know, um, behind the scenes, dirty dealings of the rich and powerful. But with this Epstein case, to your point, Ben, we covered about a year ago, everything we covered in that episode pretty much just proved to be true. And so this is an update on our earlier episode about the disgraced financier and a proven child abuser, Jeffrey Epstein. Given the graphic and troubling nature of this story, this episode may not be appropriate for all audiences. Things get pretty dark. They get dark pretty quickly. Uh, without replaying the entire episode in which we explore Epstein's biography and the high-level outline of his crimes and his M.O., uh, we can simply say that he was often advertising himself as an enigmatic hedge fund manager. The problem was that his clients, however many existed, were secret. And the weird thing is hedge fund managers leave a large traceable footprint if they are actually hedge fund managers. And yet the source of much of his wealth remains kind of a mystery. Even the amount of his wealth right. remains. Because in the uh, quote that you just read, right, billionaire is in, uh, in air quotes, right? That's right, right yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and if you haven't listened to that first episode, uh, pause this and check it out because this is valuable information. We'll hang on. We'll be right here. Great. Okay, so we're all caught up. Here are the facts. On January 4th of this year, when we released this episode, How Jeffrey Epstein Broke the Law and Got Away, we explored the rise and fall of this mysterious money man, Jeffrey Epstein. 
He was famous in financial circles for his secret list of clients, a few of whom were publicly identified, the founder of Victoria's Secret being one. He was also famous in his social circle for being a massage fanatic, constantly surrounded by women and children. You'll hear this referred to in the media as underage girls, right, or young women. To be very, very clear, the gamut or age range we're talking about here is does include, like, children who are 14. This guy was uh, a serial offender and showed no signs of letting up on his behavior. In fact, uh, it's due largely to the efforts of a journalist named Julie Brown and her team at the Miami Herald that the national public was even aware of this in the mainstream. Epstein's story made national headlines in 2018. The Herald identified 80 victims and located around 60. The spooky thing is that they all had the same story. When they were either teenagers or children, Epstein and his crew had recruited them to participate in sexual activity, including forcing them to have sex with other people at his command. A lot of times, very old men. Sure, Dershowitz one, Alan Dershowitz. I mean, that's what makes this extra disturbing is the fact that he was grooming these people to essentially, the the term that was used in that op-ed was become sex slaves. Mm -hmm. And we've heard some things come out in the news too recently about how he intended to reseed the human race by impregnating as many women as possible, like with his... Like in his image, kind of, yeah. you know, just a complete psychopath and megalomaniac and just absolute degenerate. And would never go to jail ordinarily, right? Well, that's why we, were, uh, that's why we made that episode, right? Because yeah. we, we realized that he had gotten away with it. We put it in the title. Mm -hmm. um, you know, thankfully, as we're going to continue on here, he didn't get away with it. Or at least uh, he was going to be held account. Uh, you know, that's very optimistic, it's, I think. It seemed as though it was actually happening this yeah, time. Yeah, agreed. So what, what we're talking about here is legal troubles kick into high gear in the early 2000s, way before the Herald begins writing about it. In July of 2006, the FBI began investigating Epstein in something called Operation Leap Year. Operation Leap Year resulted in an indictment in June of 2007. It was like 53 pages long, never made it to a grand jury. And that's when a guy named Alexander Acosta comes into play. Easily one of the other main villains in this story. Yes, yeah. Uh, he was, at the time, the U.S attorney for the Southern District of Florida, and he agreed to a very unusual plea deal with Epstein. The, the deal was that they would grant him immunity from all federal criminal charges for his crimes. They would also grant immunity for four co-conspirators that he had that were named and additionally anybody else. Anybody else, they'd be considered a co-conspirator. Uh, potential co-conspirators would also go unnamed and receive immunity. If that's not just giving a straight-up pass, I don't know what is. Yeah, it's, it's abhorrent. And I think he was, there was a time even during the proceedings where he was allowed to go to work. Right? Yeah, 12 hours he could be gone. Right. Yeah. And his prison door, after he was sentenced, his uh, prison door wasn't locked. He was able to use his own driver. He formed a foundation shortly before he was in this work release program and dissolved it right after. So he would go to the office for his foundation Yeah, every day. Also, the tricky thing about this is that the victims were not notified of this plea deal. Of course not. So they had no say in it. According to the Miami Herald, when this non-prosecution agreement occurs, it shuts down the FBI probe into whether there were more victims, whether there were more conspirators. The name alone is laughable. A non-prosecution agreement basically means you're fine. We're, you're, you're free. We're going to mm -hmm. leave you alone. Yeah, for a terrible, terrible comparison, imagine if you are part of a club where you recreationally go out and hop in a car and try to run over children. And then when you get caught, you, they say, okay, well, 
you know, sometimes people drive on the sidewalk and uh, we're not going to, we're not going to identify you. We're not going to identify your buddies who are in the car. Yeah. We'll just let them keep driving. And we're not even going to reach out to the parents of the, the children that you ran over. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But there's a wrinkle here already because when, after, after Acosta agrees to this, he becomes a higher up in the current presidential administration. And later when he is faced with this uh, huge WTF moment, right? Uh, he says that he was more or less forced to offer a lenient plea deal, which is a very diplomatic way to put that. Mm -hmm. He was told by someone that Epstein, quote, belonged to intelligence, was, quote, above his pay grade, and that he should leave it alone. Whoa. But Acosta took a dive for this eventually, didn't he? Like, he got mm -hmm. he, he, he got some comeuppance for, for his part in all of this. That's right. That's right, Noel, because he was the labor secretary under the Trump administration, and in July, he announced his, uh, that his resignation, that he was going to walk away from it. I don't know if that's the sort of thing you can walk away from, but here's, here's the rest of the way this works out, speaking of that work release stuff. On June 30th, 2008, he pled guilty to a state charge, one of two, of the, the way they phrase it is procuring for prostitution a girl below age 18, for which he's sentenced 18 months in prison. Most sex offenders in Florida are sent to state prison. Epstein instead was housed in a private wing of the Palm Beach County stockade. And after three and a half months, he was allowed to leave the jail on work release for 12 hours a day, six days a week. Also, just think about how they phrase that sentencing. They're calling these victims sex workers. You know what I mean? They're assigning yeah. agency to children. It makes me really sad. No, the whole thing is, 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 is I mean, I, I think this is one of the, I thought when we did that episode, it was one of the most disturbing things we had discussed because on the one hand, you don't want to, you, you can look at a, a guy like uh, Epstein who represents this unattainable level of opulence and mm -hmm. privilege, right? And you can, you can view it through the lens of, man, what if every rich, powerful man is a secret sex predator? You know what I mean? Um, well, it makes you. It made me think of the Nexium guy. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just like you know, given f complete agency to do what thou wilt. Are, are these men going to exercise their every you know debauched kind of impulse? Right. Is it going to be a real like Marquis de Sade kind of story? Yeah. Where people just push a limit to see whether it exists. I, I think what I'm the point I'm getting at though mm -hmm. is no, it's that's not the case. Likely, you true. Know? Yeah, he, it's easy to look at a monster like this and what he represents and apply that across the board to like all rich and powerful men, especially in the Me Too times that we're living in, where so many of these folks are finally having to answer for what they've done. But no, I think there are rich and powerful men that are that are not, you know, child sex predators. Yeah, there I'm sure there there are quite a few people who are like their idea of something, you know, wrong and taboo is like sneaking a milkshake when it's not cheat day on their diet, right? And their personal trainer is going to be really mad. But people are people are just people, right? Uh no matter how deified or vilified they are, this guy is a monster, and he had the means to pursue his goals. Uh, he also paid the sheriff's office 128 grand from a nonprofit to pay for the cost of his prison circumstances or his stockade circumstances. What, like extra amenities and things, or what? Yeah, he had access to attorney room where there was a TV installed for him. You know, they dedicated that wing of the county stockade to him. His office was monitored. The office of the foundation he set up and dissolved was monitored by what were called permit deputies, and he directly paid for their overtime. These guys were required to wear suits, not uniforms, and they checked in, welcomed guests at the front desk. For a time, he is essentially a free man until there's renewed scrutiny into the case, and he's ultimately arrested in New Jersey on sex trafficking charges on July 6th, 2019. Was justice around the corner, right? 
So leading up to that, I mean, he this this whole bougie jail situation, I think you said, Ben, lasted around 18 months. Mm-hmm. And then it was just back to business as usual, you know, making piles of cash and presumably even bringing in more victims, you know, into this into this sex ring. Quite possibly. And again, it goes down to the means. If somebody does not have this social or financial clout, then they're not going to, you know, have a private island. They're not going to have a Lolita Express. They're certainly not going to get a non-prosecution agreement. This guy seems set to get away uh, until that, until he is rearrested on July 6th. And he is, he is a high value target for at least factions of the government, uh, the ones who are against child abuse. I did, I was, I thought that was a united front, but that appears to not entirely be the case. That's a, that's one way to phrase it, Ben. Right. (laughs) Those those who are, who are, are not against it. What specifically led to the quote unquote renewed interest? Because what I was so surprised about was that everything we talked about in that first episode, it was all the same stuff that came back around. Right. Like there wasn't anything new, like what th- that I'm aware of. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but like what was it that that you know that kind of poked the bear and got things started again? Julie Brown and the Miami Herald in 2018. That's exactly what it was. And what's what's strange is that when we were talking about this, it may have been just the three of us off air. We, based on uh, Jimmy Savile. We, we were all pretty certain that this guy would never make it to trial. Yeah. You know, uh, there's too much dirt, there's too much murkiness. And uh, in fact, there was what a, appeared to be a possible suicide attempt perpetrated on July 23rd of this year. Yeah, he was found unconscious, I believe, on the floor of his cell with bruising around his neck. Yeah, and there were questions about whether or not it was a self-inflicted injury on his neck or if maybe his cellmate had done it lots and lots of questions but it put him on suicide watch and it it made him i mean kind of obviously somebody who's done all of these things and then made the connections within the the high levels of society uh that you would want to watch this guy closely so that occurred on July 23rd that's I mean, July 6th to July 23rd, that's not a lot of time. From that amount of time, he was arrested, put into jail, then attempted suicide, at least allegedly. Then this weekend at 6.30 a.m. on August 10th, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in his cell at the Metropolitan Correctional Center. It's also known as the MCC, the one that's in New York City. That's a very... uh, uh, if we're talking about this facility, it is locked down to the extreme. And uh, he was found dead there, apparently from suicide. So what happened? We'll explore this after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Strap in, friends and neighbors, fellow conspiracy realists. We are heading down a deep rabbit hole. It should be no surprise that many people, including the FBI and the Department of Justice, are calling for investigations into Epstein's demise. At this point, an autopsy has been conducted, more than one actually, but not yet released to the public. There are a lot of facts that are going to come to light in the coming days, and this, therefore, will be an imperfect update. So we are attempting to we're, we're attempting to gather what we know now, with the understanding that there will most definitely be new things unfolding. There isn't just one conspiracy theory in play here. There are many. Um, for example, you know, if, if we look at the broad categories of it, there is number one the idea that Jeffrey Epstein did not take his own life. Even mainstream print publications and uh, mass media news networks are referring to it as an apparent suicide. Yeah, and there's something to be said here when we, if we think back to that New York Times article, the op-ed at the beginning. Uh, it is not inconceivable that somebody that he was connected to would want him dead rather than be able to speak, especially in a trial, especially when there's discovery that's going to occur, right? For ed- evidence discovery, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
depending on what they find in his home and all of these things, you can imagine that somebody he worked with, and when I say worked with, I mean procured children for, or maybe just young women for. So not a, not in a hedge fund managing capacity. Exactly. Let's talk a little bit about some of those documents that were unsealed right before he supposedly took his own life, further implicating many more high-level potential sex offenders that he may have helped connect with underage women. Yeah, allegations, right, from Virginia Roberts, uh, last name G-I-U-F-F-R-E, Giffrey. So we do have to say that at this point these are These are allegations, but they do exist in a legal sense. The documents differ from some earlier, uh, some earlier information because they name some new people. They name New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, former U.S. Senator George Mitchell. Uh, They name members of the royal family, Prince Andrew. And it it certainly feeds into this narrative that there was some foul play uh, at work here, because I believe, you know, he said he was taken off suicide watch. Yeah. But he did have guards who were supposed to look, check in on him. And new reports show that these guards actually falsified reports that they checked in on him when they, in fact, did not for the entire day. Uh, And he was dead for several hours before he was found. You know, that's pretty fishy. Uh, but we, we don't even have to get into the speculative territory. There's enough real, real juicy information here uh, on its own. Um, back to the idea of folks who flew on that plane, the Lolita Express. We know from flight documents that both Bill Clinton and Donald Trump flew on that plane. In addition to uh, the philosopher Steven Pinker, just some very odd associates of this man. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we have to also think about the level of access very wealthy or powerful people will have. Because someone met that guy at a party doesn't mean they were part of his circle. You know what I mean? Part of his crimes. They may have just donated to the same nonprofit or something like that. However, we do we do see the rise of a lot of very disturbing and valid questions such as his cellmate which was transferred out of the cell the like the day of the death or very shortly beforehand yeah and we also see you know the suicide watch is a big question for everybody suicide watch is supposed to require 24/7 monitoring uh also active physical check-ins uh, psych evals, things like that. And those were not happening at the time of his death. And there were questions about even if his own attorneys had asked to take him off of suicide watch and stop mm-hmm. uh, all the surveillance from happening on him. So let's let's go the, back to the idea that he did not take his own life, but was murdered. The idea that there was homicide, somebody wanted to prevent news coming out, somebody with the means to exert this sort of influence in it's interesting because in right wing circles, right wing U S political circles, uh, the theory that you'll see thrown around the most is that the Clinton family had Epstein murdered. Uh, the idea goes back to, uh, the belief that, you know, you've seen the hashtag Clinton body count or something. The idea goes back to the, the concept that the Clinton family has uh, murdered multiple people. You'll hear Seth Rich shout it out on that. Um, maybe shout it out's not the right word. Uh, but that's just one of many culprits. You know, they'll say Mossad did it. The well, UK's royals did it. And the Clinton body count thing. I mean, we did an episode on that when we did, you know, during the election, we did Clinton conspiracies and Trump conspiracies. And that stuff's pretty baseless. I mean, there we, we couldn't find much evidence to sink your teeth into that that actually took place, that the Clintons actually had people killed. I agree. Yes, there's no solid evidence, obviously. They they wouldn't be walking around if there was any solid evidence that the Clintons had been murdering anyone, uh, <laughs> together or separately. There, there are a lot of somewhat peculiar instances of people either going missing or dying around sure. the Clintons, which is why... Some of some of this continues to proliferate this idea, and we even have Donald Trump tweeting about the Clinton body count in reference to 
That's uh, Jeffrey right. Jeffrey Epstein. He also has another uh, quote pertaining to Epstein from before this went down, where he's essentially saying, yeah, Jeffrey is a good friend of mine, and he likes them young. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And it's so crazy to me that Trump would perpetuate I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's like a smokescreen since he's potentially implicated too, because both of them were, you know, were on the plane. Uh, but yeah, he we retweeted this post from this guy Terrence K. Williams, who is confirmed on Twitter. I think he's like kind of a conspiracy theorist type dude. But um, it says died of suicide on twenty four seven suicide watch. Yeah, right. How does that happen? Hashtag Jeffrey Epstein had information on Bill Clinton and now he's dead. I see. Uh, hashtag Trump body count trending, but we know who did this. RT, if you're not surprised. I'm sorry. Say what you will about Trump. Again, we try not to get too political on the show, but what an irresponsible thing to, to do. Well, he's he's also connected to this story. Right. Like, how odd is that? He did kick Epstein out of Mar-a-Lago at some point. It's true. Uh, also, yeah, it's... It, it, I think there's a very valid argument to be made that maybe one should also be concerned about the cost, the possible co-conspirators and their activities or the victims. Uh, there are many of them. Oh, yeah. And it's it's strange because this is only the beginning. There's also this idea that's not quite homicide, that Epstein was allowed to take his own life. Right, that someone maybe maybe using attorney-client privilege, someone got a message to him that said something about his family, something like that, uh, and then the guards are paid to look away, or you know, a break happens at a certain mm-hmm. time. Uh, at the same time, Lie, suicide yeah. watches pulls. lie about going in. Yeah, the cellmates, uh, the cellmates skedaddled, and then you know, maybe just uh, the implements required or the time required just happens and he's expecting it. But this is, this is something I wanted to ask you guys about. This is weird. If it is true that instead of a hedge fund manager, this man was essentially a concierge of child abuse and procuring children for uh, these older men to abuse. If that's true, would he not have some sort of dead hand or kill switch system that that seems to be like the only insurance that would work. This is the idea of some sort of dossier that would be deployed to the authorities in the event of his uh, untimely death. Yeah, exactly. I think we talked about this last time. He essentially would have the most potent and perfect blackmail like ready for all of these powerful people. Because part of the reason that he was able to wiggle out of, you know, the clutches of the law in the first place was because of like his brutally aggressive legal team. You know, I mean, he did not pull any punches. He was protecting himself to the hilt. So yeah, it's a little odd that, that, but who knows, maybe it has been deployed and we just haven't heard about it yet. But I guess the point being what you're saying, I think is that it wouldn't make sense for them to bump him off. If he had something. If like he that. had something yeah. like that. Unless it was taken care of. Unless they needed the time between getting him getting arrested and the authorities going mm-hmm. through all his stuff. Maybe they discovered what they were looking for. He also had lead time in almost ev- well, in several cases where his property was searched. Sure. That's why at Palm Beach they didn't find hard drives. They didn't find, you know, CDs with video footage. DVDs. What did they find, though, Ben? They which found you're a fan of this. A fan of this? Not a fan. You're just, it's a very weird flex, the, the the things they found. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so in Palm Beach, they found all the wires uh, in which one would, you know, which that you'd use to hook up a uh, recording apparatus and video. And then in Manhattan... In a safe, they found a uh, they found a fake passport. Now, passport fraud works differently, apparently, uh, if you are a millionaire or possibly a billionaire. We would go to jail for that. He the, was able to kind of explain it away, though, to the authorities, right. right? His lawyer argued that this passport came from a friend yeah. due to concerns for uh, Epstein's physical safety. Uh, where he was when he was traveling in places uh, where there was, you know, r- a, a lot of anti Semitism. Sure. So he had an Austrian passport, his picture, a different name, and it listed his residency as Saudi Arabia. We would be under the jail. He also had. Uh, he also had several thousand in cash. I can't remember, 40 grand or something? Something like that. Yeah. And then he. Here's the kicker. <laughs> he had a bag of 48 loose diamonds. Loose diamonds. 
loose diamonds, which is conflict territory currency. Absolutely. And we also haven't talked about the drone footage of his island, his yeah. private island uh, in the Virgin Islands. Um, yeah, because he's, he's, he's at island-owning territory. He is at Bond villain level wealth. Yeah, and there's a temple on the island, or what appears to be a temple. Let's go ahead and call it a sex temple. Yeah, uh, you know that's what it feels like. It's very, very strange. Uh, that island is probably cleaned out, sanitized, or under investigation by the authorities now. But I, I believe that law enforcement, you can see on the drone footage, they've started blacking out windows and stuff. Yeah. I can't remember if we talked about this last time or not, but I just find this uh, fascinating and and very strange. On that island, there are photographs of uh, an event. He was a big fan of hanging out with scientists and physicists. One of his closest aides uh, referred to him as having the mind of a physicist. And um, there was he would do these uh, scientific conferences on that very island where a lot of this these alleged, you know, abuses were said to have taken place and included people like Stephen Hawking, uh, Nobel laureates, you know, David Gross, Frank Vilcek, physicists, uh, Jim Peebles, Alan Guth, Kip Thorne, Lisa Randall. Again, he's obviously giving money to their causes. It makes sense for them to schmooze. Uh, This is before yeah, the, the original allegations came out, so not throwing any of them under the bus. But one of these scientists who absolutely is standing accused of having forced sex with an underage girl uh, is MIT professor Marvin Minsky, who is a close friend of Epstein and was a very important figure in the development of artificial intelligence. Right. Minsky died in 2016. He was known associate of Epstein. And in that 2016 deposition, which is where the recent unsealed documents come from, she names him as one of the many prominent scientists with ties to him. Uh, She also names Dershowitz, and Alan Dershowitz has the strangest, most bizarre sort of denials or justifications. He's saying things like, oh, yeah, I got a massage, but don't worry. It was from an old, unattractive person. You know what I mean? And there were a lot of kids around, but nothing weird happened. It's difficult to parse this, but just to, just for a snapshot of how much speculation is proliferating right now, I do want to mention a third category of uh, theory that I ran into, which is that Jeffrey Epstein somehow committed pseudocide, the fancy word for faking one's own death, and escaped. By a long shot, this is the least plausible idea. But this is just the beginning. We'll pause for a word from our sponsor and then maybe dig into more of the speculation, the footage, the the groups involved, the timeline of the death. We have returned. The reality of the situation as it stands now means that we are not working with all of the information and it will continue to come out. But there are things that we have to hit upon here. You know, one one very creepy, disturbing uh, quote was that Acosta quote from earlier that somebody belongs to intelligence. What does that even mean? What is that implying? It's the implication that they are an asset. Right. Or they are uh, contracting out. Huh. So, so for instance, like in the, in the intelligence community, if we're just making up an example, let's say that you are, you are trying to conduct an operation in a country where that's unfriendly to your intelligence agency and you need to have plausible deniability. So you're not actually doing stuff. You know, you're not actually in the streets launching a coup and overthrowing the government. However, you have some connections with a local student union and they are protesting for democracy or better access to lithium or whatever. And that's that that's the kind of thing. So somebody can work with an intelligence um, outfit and not themselves be a member of the FBI or the CIA oh, or whatever. Sure, sure. So the implication there is that if we're going absolutely crazy, there's no hard proof of this yet. Uh, the implication there is that he was 
uh, practicing honey pot techniques or honey traps, if you want to call them that. And, sort of like what the steel dossier um, that Trump that you know supposedly existed on Trump um, would have been in terms of the Russian government setting honey pot traps for foreign dignitaries and then using uh, you know compromise on them to blackmail them. Yeah, yeah. compromise with a K, which is such a crazy great word. But the it's so odd that it seems so easy to find the weird inclinations of, you know, powerful people. And perhaps it's a measure of gradient. You know, I, I, if we're being dystopian, what do you think about the possibility of this scenario? What if after, after a certain amount of success, like re, genuine merit, right? What if you reach some social or uh, financial threshold of influence and power where to join the inner circle, you are required to do certain things, right? Like you are required, perhaps, and this is very, I have no proof of this. I'm just asking. This is a thought experiment. Like, let's say you're, you are up for partnership or you're going to join this, you know, international bank, whatever. And they say, okay, well, to get into the inner circle, something we all have to do. You know what I mean? Like Black Mirror example would be having sexual congress with an animal, right? Uh, this Is it something like this? And it has to be filmed and the people who are in charge have, get to keep that just in case you start doing something they don't like. Right. And intelligence communities have done stuff like this before, this extortion, this blackmail. It changes with the age, the time and place. Like in countries where uh, homosexuality was outlawed. Intelligence communities would collect that dirt on people and say, you know, vote this way or do this thing if you don't want your secret revealed. The difference here being that homosexuality is very much not a crime. And it's very much not a choice people make. It's who they are and they should have the right to live their lives. And this one was using child abuse. If, if that's the case, if that's the case, then the argument becomes that Epstein had a, uh, a backer, a state actor of some sort or a faction uh, within a state actor that was enabling his access and reaping the rewards. But back to your question, Matt, the thing that really, the thing that really horrifies me is the idea that at some point, the people who were, if this were, were some kind of intelligence operation, the people who were doing this to children, again, if it's all true, they agreed to do it. You know what I mean? They consented at least. I don't know what, what brings a person to that point. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's all conspiratorial. It has a, it feels at least in my gut, like there was something like this occurring. I cannot prove it. Um, that that the United States or some intelligence group was using him directly to do this thing as a tool. as Like you were saying, Ben, as somebody who can go into a country, not as a state actor, not as an official agent or something like that, but has the wealth and influence to make things happen. And he also has this ability to get you what you want for your messed up fantasies and you will use that against you simultaneously. Absolutely. Uh, and speaking of getting you what you want, this is really interesting. We talked about some co-conspirators and, you know, the, the question is like, what's next? Okay. So we've got Epstein is clearly out of the picture. Any prosecution against him is kind of moot. But it's certainly not moot as far as the victims are concerned or as far as the fallout for some of these co-conspirators, one of whom is a British socialite and longtime pal of Epstein's by the name of Gislon Maxwell, who's 57 years old. And ever since uh, the kind of renewed interest in this case has apparently been hiding out in a mansion in Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts, uh, an oceanfront property owned by her uh, CEO, tech CEO boyfriend, Scott Borgerson, who kind of does all the running around and walking over a dog and getting groceries, and she very rarely leaves the property. Uh, she was named in that very same deposition uh, that we've been quoting from and fought tooth and nail to keep 
those pages, those 2,000 pages um, from that defamation lawsuit against her by Virginia Guffrey, who was, you know, the one who was deposed and gave all this information with these new individuals that were connected, um, did not want that unsealed and is very clearly someone that had something to do with this very, very real crime. I think no one's questioning that this happened, that, that this man was responsible for these crimes. I know, he, I know he wasn't tried, but I just don't, I feel like he's being referred to as a pedophile. I mean, unequivocally. Maybe that's not fair. Maybe that's trying him in the court of public opinion because he definitely. But he, he already got tried in the courts and they just kind of push it away. But that's so confusing to me. I know. Like, there wasn't even a verdict rendered, right? No. Uh, in the original one, yeah, he was found guilty um, on that one count. Which one? Uh, on the count of soliciting a minor for prostitution, because like we said earlier, though, even the way that is framed right. really uh, real, is incredibly disrespectful to the victims. Absolutely. It's not like they consented at all. You know, it, it also goes, you know, Dershowitz, Alan Dershowitz was scheduled to do a mock trial in which he would defend biblical child traffickers. This is true. What? Yeah. Jesus. At a place called Temple Emanuel Stryker Center in New York. It was originally going to happen in November. It got canceled because of this sort of stuff. He would be acting as defense in the People versus Joseph's Brothers. This is an annual sure. mock trial hosted by the center based on stories from the Torah. And the idea here was that they would argue in front of a U.S. District Court judge, a person named Ronnie Abrams, and Abrams would decide whether the brothers of Joseph, who appear in Genesis in the Torah and Bible, should be held guilty for selling young Joseph as a slave. Is this some kind of sick, like, legal thought experiment? Mm -hmm. like, so strange. Well, there is some good news-ish, I guess. Uh, Senator Ben Sass, a Republican from Nebraska, uh, just this week um, urged William Barr, the attorney general, who himself was dubious of this, the apparent suicide, said that we need to launch an investigation. Whether or not that's just optics, it's hard to say, you know. Um, but Sass is calling to, quote, unquote, rip up that non-prosecution deal from 2008 and hold his co-conspirators accountable. Wow. That's real. They, they, they were just given the pass, right? Like, they weren't even... There's no black mark on their record as far as the law is concerned, you know? No yeah. no legal uh, ramifications. Right, and they're alive and well, living in million-dollar palatial estates, you know, by the sea. Exactly, and we have to wonder, look, whether you think you're the most skeptical person has ever set foot upon this uh, crazy experiment of ours called Earth, or whether you think uh, the the things that the mainstream considers the most out there are the most true, the fact remains, something very, very rotten is present. Something happened and is happening, right? And we felt obligated to make this this update, you know, uh, but we will probably have to keep looking into this uh, because stories like this, as strange as it sounds, they can disappear. Well, and at the very least, this very strange handling of a very serious crime in the original case is kind of being treated like not that big a deal. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, no, like, I know exactly what you mean. Um well, it makes me want to go back to that New York Times article for just one more minute, you guys, uh, it, to the end. I'm going to read a quote from this article again. It, this makes so much sense to me. Okay, so imagine right now if we didn't know anything about Jeffrey Epstein. We just knew what was on the surface about him. He's some billionaire hedge fund manager guy that manages a bunch of rich people's money. Um, that's all we know about him, right? Then imagine that, let's say we're sitting in a hotel bar or something. Somebody walks up to us, and here's, here's the quote. Um, imagine being told all we know about him, uh, that he wasn't just a billionaire, but a man mysteriously made and mysteriously protected who ran a pedophile island with a temple to an unknown god and plotted his own Boys from Brazil endgame in plain sight of his Harvard, D.C. house of Windsor Pals. It's, it would be insane. You would not believe that for a second. 
that idea of a conspiracy theory feeling so uh, out there. Mm -hmm. it, it's perfectly uh, represented there. But it's but it's true. <laughs> oh, no. But we've talked on the show multiple times about how the term conspiracy theory in itself is so reductive. And it's it's literally there's a word for it, Ben. You, you, you might you might remember um, just of, of like when you're trying. It's that cognitive dissonance, maybe or like when thought terminating, thought terminating cliche. cliche. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. This is it's this idea that by calling something that you're dismissing its veracity on all levels and you're you're like basically belittling the person that's trying to discuss this with you to crackpot territory. And that's a really important part to us about this show is that we do try to look at all sides and we talk about these things for a reason, because even if, you know, things are largely false, it's an interesting part of the human condition to like look for answers and try to, even if it's in kind of a weird reverse engineered way, but this is a perfect example of, of a thing that is absolutely provable on so many levels and absolutely represents things that are happening in the shadows all the time, I would say. I suggest that we, since we can't answer all the questions yet, and maybe hopefully will be able to one day, uh, I suggest we end on one last question. If there was compromise, if there was video or uh, photographic footage or evidence of these crimes occurring, like physically we could see, you know, these named co-conspirators and others uh, engaging in these crimes. Who has the footage? That would be one of the most explosive and powerful things to possess. We know that somehow Epstein got hipped to a search in advance at least once. So where did it go? Did he destroy it? Is it somewhere else? I bet it's backed up in multiple countries in multiple banks. I bet you that's where it is. That's just complete speculation. Maybe. But I can imagine him traveling around and putting it in like a deposit box. Building redundancy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's call this breaking news. So we recorded the episode on Epstein yesterday, which which you just heard, uh, and then it stayed with us because we said it would be an imperfect update. And uh, I owe Matt and Noel an apology because I started texting you guys uh, at like four something in the morning as more news broke. And so now we've gotten together. I think we've all had about a, a collective four hour, four hours of sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Ben is not joking. It really was four in the morning. And the stuff that he was sending us was so explosive, we realized we absolutely had to add it to this episode. Yeah. The, the three of us, um, as soon as we woke up, would have probably received tons of notifications about this stuff. And we didn't want this episode to come out without it. Because you see... Uh, Jeffrey Epstein's bodyguard in Palm Springs, a guy named Igor Zinovev. A uh, former UFC fighter. Former UFC fighter, uh, mysterious Russian MMA fighter, uh, just became the subject of a huge amount of scrutiny because there is a text interview with him that was released and is frankly chilling and damning and matt you went through and found excerpts of this thing i did just for a little more context it's a phone call that happened between this this journalist and igor and it's in reference to or an update to a previous phone call that they had in 2015 and igor like apparently it took forever to try and track him down nobody's been able to get a hold of this guy but because this journalist had an in already through speaking to him in 2015, I guess Igor picked up the phone call. And that journalist is M.L. Nestel, uh, who, you know, if that name pops up as a suicide, I would also not believe it. Well, here's why. Let, let's get into some of the quotations here. So as we said, this is in reference to a previous conversation. Now, in this version, the 2019 conversation, the, uh, the journalist, one more time, what's the name? That is M.L. Nestel, N-E-S-T-E-L. Okay, so Nestel is noticing that Igor is being extremely evasive in the previous things that he had stated in 2015. So I'm gonna let's read a couple of things here. 
So this is Nestel, the journalist. In our conversation in 2015, you described his relationship with teenage girlfriends, quote, so many times I tried to stop him. I tried to tell him my opinion about that. He don't listen to me. That's the reason why I'm not working for him no more. I make him do that to let me go. Do you remember saying that? And so before we get to his response, we want to be clear that because this is a phone call, uh, the journalist made the decision not to try to correct any grammar. No paraphrasing. No paraphrasing. This is exactly the physical record of what Igor said. So his response in the second interview is, it's not the teenage girls. I never see the teenage girls. I tell you, I never see teenage girls. Plenty of times when I work for him, I never see anything improper or teenage girls around him. That's what I say. And again, that quote from earlier from the journalist is exactly what was stated the last time they spoke. And he's he's now denying it. Why don't we go on just a little bit? Okay. Because okay. we can feel the tension here. So, he's, so the journalist says, so now you say you only saw him with women older than 18, 20? All what I say, he has always been with girlfriends, and there was a couple girls. I don't remember their names. She was 25 and worked for him as assistant. Maybe 25 or 23, whatever. I don't know the age. Okay, but you definitely told me that last time we talked. No, no, it's not that. He working like work release on other stuff, and I just tell him, you know, he would order his girlfriends around, and I told him, calm down. It's not just teenage girls. I never see teenage girls in my life at his house. That's what it is. That's a misunderstanding completely. Uh, and then he goes on and it's true. I think this is really important. It's true uh, without hearing the intonation of the conversation. We can maybe find ourselves reading some tea leaves. So basically he's backpedaling on the age like he, he unequivocally in the first comment said i tried to stop him mm -hmm. the teenage girls it was weird and then god the amount of times he says teenage girls yeah. in the second one the yeah. rebuttal or with the, i guess the where he kind of pulls back it sounds so much like he's got something to hide or, or has a talking point yeah maybe, exactly you know? yeah so so we have to remember here he was functioning as bodyguard and driver sometimes for and Epstein. Uh, live in and combat trainer and right. combat trainer mm -hmm. in light combat at least according at least according to igor but he lived on in a guest house uh, on a property of Ooh. Epstein for a long time. He would drive Epstein to locations where he would stay in the car. Epstein would leave for a couple hours and come back. Now, most of this is during the time that Epstein was in jail, but he was getting those 12-hour releases yeah, where he would go ago. and have these meetings and Igor would just shuttle him around. So I want to go to a different part of this too. Uh, so several times in this interview, the journalist is literally quoting verbatim back to uh, Igor. And there's this one part that really stands out, and it's an old quote that he says, all right? Uh, the journalist is saying, I understand this is sensitive. Igor saying, it's not sensitive. It's just kind of a little uncorrect. And then the journalist goes in hard and says, it's exactly what you said. I can send it to you. Here's something else you said. It could be tricky, you know. Normally he, meaning Epstein, always checks his newspapers. Nothing about me, I say. No, he say, they forget about me. And when I mentioned Epstein was being exposed for messing with teenage girls, you said, I'm not surprised at all. I'm just surprised how low he can be outside the real world. Someday is going to call him and it will be real jail. He has so much money he can pay it off. Me personally, if I caught him with my daughter or something like that, I'm not going to go to police. I do something else much worse. That guy could try to sue me and manipulate the situation with his money. That's the American way. I know he screwed up a lot of fashion girls also. That's a different story. Why would he be so candid like that? With, I, a, with a reporter. I guess he thought it was untouchable, you know? Yeah. Like nothing would come of it because nothing had. But that changed. No, I mean, would, I would think he would consider, you know, especially what he's saying about how powerful and rich Epstein is, how he's, un, he's untouchable. Why would he go out on a limb like that about his employer and put himself in the line of fire like well, that? Well, he was, he was an employee, right? You, you can only speculate what... Epstein might have on him or something like that, but th who, who knows that kind of thing. In this case, it's just a guy talking about his employer who was in a lot of legal trouble. That's what I'm imagining in 2015. But I see the motivation too. Like it doesn't sound 
like good housekeeping or good employee employer yeah. hygiene. Uh, but we have to remember, legally speaking, uh, we don't, this guy doesn't have attorney client privilege or anything. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there might be some sort of NDA, you know, or some equivalent, but it gets really, it gets really spooky. And you can read the entirety of the phone call, at least for now, uh, in the transcript form on nymag.com. Uh, but let's let's look at another segment of this because this does escalate. Right now, we just have a guy who sounds like he's trying to walk back some some smack he was talking in 2015. Yeah. But this next part is very different. Yeah, it's just um, before we get into it's really odd to me that he would walk it back after he's dead. Like, it seems like he would have less to lose letting his original statements ride. Unless you know I mean? Epstein wasn't the dangerous one. That, that, ex- exactly. There's something else going on here. So he goes, I'm not afraid. Beyond that, just he is dead. I don't want anything to be uncorrect. There's too much in here, you know, already. He's dead and just like freaking people. Just leave him alone. Then the journalist asks, hold on. When did you find out he died? Saturday or Sunday or whenever. Uh, what did you think when you found that out? What did I think? Yeah. Are you sure you want to hear what I'm going to think? Yes. Somebody helped him to do that. You think somebody helped him kill himself? Yeah. Okay, why? Listen, you know, that's going a little too deep. I mean, I'm just trying to understand that maybe you'd be happy he was dead, or you would be upset. I don't know. Are you even feeling anything? I'm not sad. I mean, I didn't have anything against him, like a bad thing, you know? I don't care about his life completely. I don't give, uh, let's say, like, Crap about how he died, how he lived, or how he's managed. How he's managed. Jeez. Uh, how many years did you live in his house? Five or six years in Palm Beach. That's a long time. Yeah. You don't have any emotion after learning he died? No. Did you think it would happen to him? It's unexpected. Well, it's like... Well, I realize others tried to talk to you. Did he ever offer money? Uh, did he, anybody ever try to silence you? No. I get that, but you and I have a history at this point. One thing you told me, for instance, okay, one thing you told me is he got a heads up to when the authorities were going to come to his house the night before. Listen, what you say is between you and me. You told me he would get phone calls the night before. At 8 o'clock, the police are going to come. He would get a heads up from the local police. We've got some silence, some serious silence here. Uh, You told me that, Igor. You want me to read the quote back to you? Well, you can read whatever you want right now. Don't just, you can put yourself in big trouble. Whoa. Yeah, that's what he said. You can put yourself in big trouble. Sounds like a threat to me. Well, I don't know if it's a threat from him. I mean, it sounds like he's a little scared. More of a warning. And it goes on because the journalist, this journalist is top notch. Yeah, here he is reading the quote. You said, he always do something wrong. There was some nights in question There was at home arrest and police. Before they come to the house, they call him and tell him they're coming in at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's all corruption, you know. It's all bullshit. Listen, don't put yourself in trouble. Seriously. Okay, pause. So that is a huge implication there, or a, a huge accusation. It's a huge statement saying that the local police, we talked about this in the episode, how he would get a heads up and know like to clean things out of the house if they were, if the authorities were coming over in the morning. This is what the bodyguard who lived with him is saying is happening. Yeah. Which is not, you know, not smoking gun proof, but is very chilling circumstantial proof. And then from here on, Igor attempts to persuade this person journalist to to drop it to let this stuff go and we left off where he says uh don't put yourself in trouble seriously but the reporter just like you know amore eel clamping down continues we talked about this i understand we got this i'm telling you to give you a chance to remember because we talked about this stuff. I know it's hard. I don't know what you mean about put myself in trouble. Let that go. Seriously, let that go. Why is it so important? Are you worried about the local cops? Listen, you're really smart, and I'm not going to offer that over the phone right now, okay? You're really smart. You have no idea. Please. What do you mean by that? I can't explain you. I can't explain you over the phone any of this. You said that last time and we didn't talk for years. You can tell the world who this guy was. You were with him for a long time. You know what I mean? 
silence. I totally understand that you think he could have had help committing suicide. First of all, I have to go right now. I have another client. Still training people? Yes, but just be careful. I am not kidding. What's your email so I can send you? Don't do any kind of that stuff. Just don't play it, seriously. Can you tell me why? I can't. I can't. May I ask you one more question? Go ahead. Have you been talking to anyone in the government, the FBI? Have they come to you? There's a long pause here. Um, great talking to you. Seriously, we'll, we talk later. Really? Bye. All right. Bye. That's insane. That was 4 a.m. last night, we're, as we're reading through all of that. Um, it's bonkers, man. Whoa. So, again, not foolproof. No. But chilling chilling stuff and uh, especially all the you better you better watch it seriously let that go let it go man that's like some movie stuff right there i mean well that is a dangerous dude this is a this is an mma fighter who was good at his job there's a picture of him too so he is kind of enigmatic we don't have a lot of information on him yet but we have another quick update we found uh those uh, those prison guards that we mentioned uh who I think, as you had mentioned, Noel, they had been asleep and falsified records on the night of the death or the at the time of the death. At the very least, they did not check on him at all and claim that they did. I, I, was the asleep thing confirmed? Apparently, yes. Apparently, they were not only sleeping on their job, literally, uh, they were also not the regular guards. They were temporary guards who had been assigned. Uh, and it feels weird to say, you know, it's my first few days of work with some guy I probably don't know that well, but I'm comfortable enough for both of us to snuggle up and take a snooze. Wow. I mean, maybe people have just a very different sense of boundaries. Especially with what's at stake. And we did talk about a little bit about how within the United States uh, system of prisons, there is a lot of being overworked as employees. Sure. Right? So like taking a nap, I don't know. It's not completely out of out of bounds of reason, but at the same time, for two at the same time, and right when they were temporarily brought on on the day of this event, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, know. it sure seems like there was some manipulation going on. Maybe they were brought in because they were in the know. You know, like they they weren't going to ask questions. I, I don't know. Who knows? But um, so that certainly continues to make the mind real. And then we got the autopsy results back. Well, we got part of yes, them, partial, right? partial. And this is this is the other thing we found uh, in the wee hours of the morning. A report from the Washington Post cited two people familiar with the findings of one of the autopsies, and it shows that Jeffrey Epstein sustained multiple breaks in his neck bones, including what's called his hyoid bone. That's sort of a like a picture of a horseshoe, and if you're a dude, it's located near your Adam's apple, uh, and The Post says, quote, such breaks can occur in those who hang themselves, particularly if they are older, according to forensic experts and studies on the subject, but they are more common in victims of homicide by strangulation. Whoa. Yeah, and and let's not forget that other attempt Mm -hmm. where he had bruising around his neck. And I don't know that we mentioned this in in the main part of the episode, but there were shrieks heard coming from his cell. You don't, you don't, I you didn't don't, even know that. You don't, ha- yeah. you don't shriek when you're hanging yourself. You that shriek out. when yeah. you're being strangled or when you're being attacked. And, and I had a really great conversation um, with uh, Jack O'Brien. We're actually just FYI, but people behind the curtain, we're in Orlando for this podcast convention podcast movement and have been lucky enough to get to hang with some of the West Coast folks from uh, from our network. And Jack, who does the Daily Zeitgeist, a fantastic show, was really interested in this. And we all spoke to him about it briefly, but um, he made the point of, This is a guy who has demonstrated zero remorse, who has been able to wiggle his way out of every situation that he's been in because of his sheer wealth and opulence and and connections, right? I would say, yeah, even more so the connections. Absolutely. All of that combined. This is not a man who kills himself out of shame. This is a man who waits it out and sees what's going to happen and sees what kind of out he can get. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. He was already shamed. If the shame was going to do it for him, why didn't he do it? Why didn't he kill himself before? When he al- he was- yeah, he also doesn't have a, a, f- a big family that we know of. Right. 
children that we know of because the typical mob or criminal tactic would be to coerce suicide by threatening one's uh, loved ones, right? But the that leverage doesn't seem to exist. I was on uh, the Daily Zeitgeist, Jack and Miles podcast, talking about Epstein um, a little bit more, and they they made the same point again, but before this information came out, you know, in this show, we're very careful to be very clear with all of our fellow listeners if we're giving our opinion rather than facts. And, you know, I I have to be honest, this is just my opinion, and I I definitely don't speak for everybody, but this is rotten. Something is not right. This guy, for for one or two of these circumstances to happen, sure, okay, right? Uh, Overworked prison guards are not at their job 100%, right? Or uh, maybe someone with suicidal ideation is misdiagnosed by an overworked psychologist, right? Or psychiatrist. Uh, But for all these different things to happen at once, at the same time, it's, it can't be a coincidence. I feel like I'm Charlie Day and always sunny in Philadelphia (laughs) in the mail room pointing at stuff with a bunch of red string here, but I, I don't think it's off base. Who is Pepe? Who is Pepe? He doesn't even exist. There is no Pepe. <laughs> How many times are we do that? I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I know. I know. I, I, don't, I don't think. I, I don't remember the scene. I don't know who Pepe is either. Um, no, that's the thing, and that's why that that op ed that we led led the show with, I think, is so interesting because this idea of a conspiracy theory or a conspiracy theorist is like a thought terminating cliche. Um, this is this. These are two very real things: conspiracies where people collude together. You know, for an end, a common end, and theory is a way of discussing open-mindedly, hopefully, in our case, those potential collusions. And this is just a clear-cut case where these theories that we're putting out there are absolutely plausible. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't even call this conspiracy theorizing at this point. It's much more like investigative true crime. Yeah, yeah, uh, following the breadcrumbs and putting together the puzzle. Okay, and now back to the thing from yesterday. We want to hear from you. Let us let us know what you think about this story. Is it a story that will somehow fade from the news? Is this just another chapter in what will be a long continuing saga? And do you believe this idea about ties with intelligence agencies? And if so, uh, do you also believe that there's a, a situation where he captured footage? And do you think there are other situations in the past that we should be looking into that are kind of like that, that have occurred? Maybe we just don't know about it yet. Mm-hmm. Send it our way. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook where we're Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, we're Conspiracy Stuff Show. You can hang out at our community page on Facebook called Here's Where It Gets Crazy. You can have discussions about this and all other topics there with your fellow conspiracy realists. That page was going nuts when this news dropped. Yeah. Check out all the memes. It's uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. You can give us a call. We are 1-833-STDWYTK. Leave a message. Tell us what you think. Make sure to tell us if you do or do not want your name on the air or, you know, just any specifics. What uh, is it? Three-minute cutoff? Mm-hmm. Try to keep it within three. To do a tight three. Yeah. Y'all keep leaving messages. There are hundreds Hundreds and hundreds for us to let me rephrase that. If if it needs to be longer than a tight three, you can call back and and do a continuation. Sometimes these stories take longer than three minutes, and it's unfortunately a uh, limitation of this voicemail service that we have. But we definitely want to hear from you. And a lot of you have already uh, sent us messages via voicemail about Jeffrey Epstein. And thank you, thank you for writing to us. We do also want to let anyone listening know that if you have found yourself in an abusive situation or know someone who needs help, uh, you are not alone, neither are they. There are 24-7 crisis resources and hotlines. You can call 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 656-4673 to speak with counselors 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's fantastic. Thank you for doing that, Ben. And if you don't want to do any of the communication with us, and you just want to send us a good old-fashioned email, we are conspiracy at iheartradio.com.
Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.